Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello, Anthony. Hi, Hi Thomas. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Good to see you here, Anthony. We're getting a little bit of an echo, uh, Anthony, so I think we'll have to mute when the other one's talking. So let me start off here real quick. Hello, everybody. Glad to see everybody uh, here live with us on Facebook and uh, YouTube and everywhere else. Today, we're going to be talking about five ways, five pretty easy ways to instantly make your blues guitar playing sound better. Uh, and I brought in my longtime friend. Uh, oh, we also affectionately call him the King of Belgium. He, he is uh, fantastic, runs a big music school over there for them, actually. Uh, Anthony Reinert from uh, Belgium. Welcome, Anthony. Thanks, Thomas. It's an honor to be here and pleasure, as always. All right. Very good. So, Anthony, um, you know, you obviously you teach a lot of people in Belgium. You've got you've taught hundreds and hundreds, but maybe thousands by now of students, lots of students uh, in your music schools. And I know you're also teaching uh, blues guitar online. So you're you are the blues guitar lesson guru guy. And I wanted to uh, get into some easy ways that anyone watching us now or watching the recording later. Uh, can improve their blues guitar playing pretty quickly. Now, so maybe you can share like whatever, if you can think of five sort of tips or secrets or things that you use uh, to make so many of your guitar students become, you know, these killer players that they, that they become. So uh, if you want to start, maybe go like one at a time, let's begin with, um, let's begin with number five. So, We'll save the best for last. So number five, best guitar tip for blues guitar players. What do you got? All right. Great question. So I think if we have to compile this list of five things, we need to start out with looking at what are the lowest hanging fruits, so to speak, that people can get into pretty easily. And also look at what is holding them back. A lot of intermediate and beginner players start out learning all kinds of things and they think the more i learn the better i become but we will talk about and we will start off with this uh, very very cool thing that you can do you don't need to learn any more licks to implement this uh, fifth thing on my list here and it's actually a really um, a really good advice that I got from a lot of uh, great teachers over the years when I was starting to um, pick up the guitar. And it's, it is very simple. It's stop the wimpy picking and stop the wimpy playing in general. And a lot of people, they play really with, without a lot of force in their right hand, without a lot of force in their left hand, because there's a lot of confusion also about this topic uh, a lot of teachers tell you well you should um, play with a minimum amount of force is this true yes totally but only in certain circumstances Cer un under certain circumstances this is the best advice under other circumstances this is not so good to implement in your playing because you need a lot of force in your hands if you want to thicken up your sound, if you want to sound really um, bluesy, have this blue sound that a lot of people aspire. And I will show you a couple of examples here. A lot of people uh, start out playing this. And everything they play sounds kind of meh. It's like kind of weak because they pick weak and they uh, they fret um, down weak, so they press down the strings in a very weak manner. So the very first thing, um, if this sounds like you, you can start uh, implementing and you can start fixing this right now, is to look at the motions of the right hand. And if you're picking like in a very weak manner, this is really easy to fix. You just need to start picking with more force and it will change your guitar playing, the sound that comes from your guitar playing overnight. Instead of playing like this and sounding like this, 
you will sound like. So it gives a lot, a lot more to your playing if you start um, going away from getting away from the wimpy picking. Also, with the left hand, uh, as stated before, it's really good advice if you want to um, fly over the fretboard to use the minimum uh, possible amount of, of uh, tension in your finger. If you want to play legato style, or you want to pick uh, very fast. It's really good advice. You don't need a lot of tension because the tension is going to kill your speed. Um, but uh, if you're playing slow uh, licks, bluesy licks, um, heartfelt solos, you need to press harder because otherwise you will sound like what I was playing before. If you do the opposite and you start pressing harder, your sound will thicken up. Uh, very uh, fast. <laughs> so this sounds totally different from this. And if you're watching online right now, or you're watching uh, on YouTube uh, somewhere uh, in the coming period, and it sounds like you're playing, this is something you can do right now. Start playing with more force and both hands and experiment with thickening up your sound this way. Awesome. Very good stuff. I, I love that, Anthony. I, I, what I like so much about that is you know, a lot of the students that I teach, and maybe you've discovered this too with all the people you teach, is that everyone or many people are very, they're trying to be so careful about their technique and making sure that everything is clean and pristine. And of course, we want to play clean and accurate and all that stuff and play with good technique and all of those things. But sometimes when, when people are focused so much on technique, or on trying to reduce tension or both they they play very in a very timid way they're they're almost afraid to just just hit the guitar just hit the damn thing and if you make a mistake you make a mistake but you know at least it was with conviction you know you put your yourself behind the notes and you know you, you you're playing with some sort of power so you have something really to say and you want everybody to hear it this is you know, it's at least as equally important, if not more important than having flawless, clean, perfectly clean technique. You know, I'd rather listen to someone make an error here and there and play with conviction than to hear everybody play real perfect, but play very timidly and wimpy. That's not very nice to listen to, at least not for me. And I think for many people. So that that's a super great uh, suggestion there, tip. Uh, thank you for that, Anthony. So let's go to now um, number four. What would be your next tip? Tip number four, secret number four here, Anthony. What do you All got? Right. So when you get this into your playing, and as stated before, a lot of people miss this. They miss uh, the conviction in their playing, and like you added to the conversation just now, it is something people miss a lot, like if they play double stops, it sounds very weak, but it has to sound, uh, in, in blues playing especially, like, very, very heartfelt, and this will help, and going further in the same, um, in the same tactic of playing with more force, um, my fourth on the list here is to add vibrato. And not only just vibrate like a lot of people do it, and there are a lot of mistakes being made um, by even people who play for years or even decades. They just don't get the vibrato down right. So it comes from first what we just discussed, playing with more force in the left hand, because if you're only minimizing your tension all of the time, you won't sound great with vibrato. It will sound like... This. You need to press harder if you want to add heartfelt vibrator to your playing. So coming from this, we need to look at the motion from the vibrator. And the second point is a lot of people, they do it 
uh, wrong and they have the timing wrong. They have a lot of mistakes in their vibrator. <laughs> And they also tend to overcomplicate uh, a lot of the, the techniques behind a good vibrator. And it's not to say that this isn't important, but let's look first with what's going wrong and then we need to fix this. So if this sounds like you don't feel like embarrassed, uh, a lot of people start out with uh, vibrator doing the wrong way. And uh, what is going wrong with a lot of people is that they play vibrato, but they just hold it for a, a, a very a few seconds, depending on, on the beats per minute. They just hold it really quickly, and then they stop doing the vibrato. So it sounds like this, and then they stop doing it, or they uh, tend to um, sustain the note, but without the vibrato. So then it sounds like... And okay, uh, this is good to start out with, but we need to fix this if this sounds like you. So my fourth tip is adding good vibrato. And it's such an important technique. It uh, humanizes the voice of the guitar, in my opinion. So we need to install this in your playing um, to get to uh, the level of uh, where you want to design. So here's a really good tip on uh, fixing vibrato if you sound like a uh, really fast narrow vibrato so a uh, thing you can do is start wiggling the string but start like it's like a string massage it's like you start wiggling the string back and forth and a lot of people they say do i need to push or pull the string well it doesn't matter you can even do both you can push and pull if you want but it's like giving <laughs> the string a little massage here this is what you need and you need to start out slowly you need to wiggle the string in a really slow manner and if you can't do this then you won't be able to do it fast but a lot of people they try to cram in vibrator while they are improvising so this is a mistake because you won't be able to um, develop your vibrator technique if you don't practice it in isolation you need to practice it separately so you just take five minutes and you just try to massage one of the notes with one of the fingers like you can start with the index and you try to get the timing right because like everything in music it needs to sustain the same amount of timing unless you do it on purpose unless you change the timing um, and the, va the note values on purpose if you set out your your vibrator timing you need to continue uh, until the the note um, is comes at an end so let's say we play four beats like a whole note of this c note and you want to add vibrato to the note and then you go to another note like here the b note i'm adding vibrato here on c note it's really important to continue the vibrato to the end of this measure now in this case because a lot of people would do it like and then they stop doing it and then they go to the next note so you need to really get in there use a lot of pressure and massage the string to get uh, acquainted with vibrato in the beginning and it will be a game changer if you haven't uh, developed this technique yet in your playing good stuff Anthony good stuff great stuff I just want to add uh, one little thing that uh, you said Anthony uh, one of the things that Anthony just mentioned was that he said that sometimes when people are playing vibrato, they'll start off doing the vibrato, uh, you know, in the beginning of the note. Oop. Sorry, guys. Let's try this again. They'll start off doing the vibrato. Anthony, I'm going to have to make you go away for just one second so they can see my hand. There we go. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get Anthony back in here in a minute. Uh, they start doing the vibrato. And then they stop, and then we have like a dead note that has no real life left into it at the end, like this. And I agree totally with what Anthony said. But what I'm going to suggest is something in addition to what Anthony was describing is to do the opposite of that. So what Anthony was saying was when you do the vibrato, keep it going. 
for the remainder of the life of the notes. Okay. And what I'm going to suggest, and I, I agree with that. I think that's awesome. That That's correct. But also another thing you can do is you can start off by playing the note without vibrato. Wait a beat or two beats or three beats and then add the vibrato. So this is called delayed vibrato. So in this case, I play, I'm playing this note, this note here, I'm letting it ring, and then I add the vibrato. Here's another example. If I do it on a bench string, so I bent the string. I did not apply a vibrato right away. I let the note hang there, and then I added the vibrato. You will hear this done. A lot of pop singers do this, okay? Uh, the first time I heard it and paid attention to it was uh, Whitney Houston. And it sounds cool when that note is hanging there, whether it's a bent note or not, and then you apply vibrato. That's also cool. So both ways, instant vibrato, where you do vibrato right away when the note is played, and then you continue doing the vibrato. That's what Anthony was talking about at one point. And then the delayed vibrato was just another way. But in, in both cases, uh, I, I think it's better, and I think Anthony might agree because he was talking about it, to not play a note and then stop and let the note kind of just die there. So if you want to do it for that effect, I guess it's okay. But sometimes people kind of do it by default, and it just sounds like they ran out of gas. And I think that's maybe not exactly the sound that you were looking for. But great stuff here, Anthony. Um, let's move on to your tip or secret number three. What's number three on your list, Anthony? All right. So number three on my list is a very simple advice also, but we all always forget the simple stuff to implement the low-hanging fruit first. And it's make more from what you already got. Like a lot of people think they need to wait until they like play a gazillion, gazillions of guitar techniques until they can make music with it and they can improvise. And the opposite is quite true. And if you listen to a lot of jazz guys, but uh, the blues and even rock, this is also true. Um, they can play amazing solos with only one technique. And um, if you want to experience this yourself, you can just take the, uh, it's not the easiest technique because you can make it very complicated, but the technique that most people start learning, like phrasing technique wise, is a slide. And you can actually improvise a great solo with slides. And especially like with the jazz example, a lot of jazz guys play uh, like a simple pentatonic scale, but with a lot of applied slides. Like <laughs> just on the top of my head it's not like a, a melody or something from a record but it's just i took the minor pentatonic scale and i just gave it a go with adding little slides to uh two positions here um of, of this pentatonic scale so if you are already familiar with the minor pentatonic scale you can just start improvising your own solos with little slides with adding little slides and there are uh, very, very um, many ways to do this. You can, uh, like I did before, uh, slide in from one over four, and uh, especially here in the minor pentatonic scale, this kind of sounds really cool. Give some chromatic feel if you add a lot of these little slides, and if you just do it uh, once, it's uh, also a really cool phrasing technique. So here I slid into the C note starting from the B note. And if you know the minor pentatonic scale, you, do, you know that the B note isn't part of it. But at this point, we don't care because we aren't landing on these notes. We're just using them as ornamentation techniques. 
Good stuff, Anthony. All right. One thing, Anthony, if I can add this, I'm going to go full screen here for just one second. Uh, if I can add to one of the things that Anthony, he did it. I'm not sure if you guys caught it or not, but when he was improvising the first time with the slides, one of the cool things that he did, he did something called a backslide. He did it more than once. And uh, a backslide is something that you can do on any note. It sounds great anywhere, okay? But if there's a note that you're going to hang on or you want to accent, um, instead of landing on just that note and then, let, let's for example, if, I'm, uh, if I do this. So that was a backslide there. A backslide simply means you, you play a note, you slide away from it, and you slide right back to it. That's a backslide. This is not a backslide. That's called a descending slide. <laughs> okay, just slide, you're sliding down. That's a descending slide. That's not a backslide. This is a backslide. Or play a note, slide away, you slide right back into it. So Anthony was doing that occasionally. So there, I just did one. So it sounds cool. And I'm not sliding to any place in particular. You can slide to the next note in the scale, but you don't have to. You can slide, you know, wherever you want. And just put them in there wherever. So it's it's a cool thing to add in to all the other things that Anthony was talking about. And he actually did do it uh, a few times. Um, I, don't, I don't think I didn't hear Anthony specifically call it out, but he was doing it. So that's cool stuff, Anthony. Thanks for that. Uh, let's go to, I'm sorry, do you want to talk more about that, Anthony? Yeah, thanks for adding about this backslide because a lot of people tend to overcomplicate everything and, and they want to improvise with a lot of techniques. But um, going further on, on this, how simple it all can be, like if you just take the minor pentatonic scale and you play a descending from the C note here and A minor pentatonic in this case, and now you play this. Of course, this doesn't really sound like music, but even if you just on the last note here at like this backslide, for example, you have this lick. And it opens up uh, a lot of possibilities that you're playing if you're just starting out improvising. And even if you're playing a, lot, a long time, you can just add more of these slides and so it's like... So I only added slides here in this example and uh, the vibrator on the end. So we can do a lot of uh, with these slides. And I don't think we have time to go through every one of them because they're like hundreds of different uh, examples and combinations of slides and uh, like you mentioned the backslide but uh, slides is really a uh, cool uh, low-hanging fruit to get into very good uh, i'm sort of smiling here because uh it's it's just a cool technique it's not hard to do it's pretty easy anyone can do it you just simply slide away come back in either direction and it just it, it makes it sound a bit more expressive so before we go on to the next tip, I want to just sort of call out for those of you who are not familiar with, I mean, most of you know who Anthony is, very well-known guy. But if you want to check out Anthony's YouTube channel, we just put the link in the chat. Uh, and if you want to check that out after we're done, he's got a lot of great videos and a lot of cool topics like this that go into more detail as well. So Anthony, let's move to your number two thing that people can do right away to improve their blues guitar playing. What do you got for us? Number two. Right. So we already mentioned thickening up your sound and how important it is if you want to sound like bluesy, if you want to sound thick on guitar and play with conviction. And one technique and uh, specifically designed to do this, and it's called the rake technique. Not a lot of people use it. Not a lot of people even know about it. It's R uh, the R A K. E, to spell it out, the rake technique. And also uh, Tom has mentioned the YouTube channel so you can find a lot of phrasing techniques and other cool things on the on the channel. So there's a link in the chat and thanks for mentioning uh, the YouTube channel. 
but I will go to the most simple version of doing the rake if you haven't implemented this in your playing yet. And thanks for spelling out the word in the chat for the people who haven't heard about it. So the simplest method to start doing the rake is going about uh, it this way. You just uh, take your pinky finger, you press down any note that you want to play, like here the uh, G note on the B string here. Um, and then the other fingers uh, have a passive role here. So I'm just uh, laying them flat on the strings, but I'm not pressing them down. Only the pinky finger is on the note that I want to sound. And here with my right hand, I'm doing this. I'm playing all of the notes, but they will sound dead. Um, with the only exception being the note that I want to hear. So here, the G note again. I can do this very fast, like, but a lot of uh, people start out with doing the rake uh, very slowly. And it's a good practice to just start out practicing this slowly. And it's a cool technique because it totally thickens up your sound if you're playing uh bluesy licks and you're adding this technique <laughs> and then I added vibrato so no I'm already combining a total of three techniques but you can start out of course uh, and it's best to start out with only this break so you just put your pinky finger on the note you want to sound and then the other fingers are laying here uh, just as passive fingers to dampen the strings <laughs> I can start out playing like whole lines on, on just one string. So like uh, if you pick out the notes from the A minor pentatonic scale on the B string. You can just experiment with doing this, playing all of the notes, but you're just raking the strings and only hitting the note. And, and making it sound uh, the note on the B string. So this is a great technique to start out with, to thicken up your sound. It's uh, designed to do this. So a lot of players use it. Cool stuff. I'll uh, depending upon what use. I don't know what you're. I don't know yet. Let me say it again. I don't yet know what you're going to say for your number one tip. So if you don't say something. If you don't say what I think you might say, then I'm going to come back and ask you a follow-up question on something you did, but you didn't talk about. So some people might have been curious about it when they saw it. So I'll hold off until we find out what is your number one uh, easy thing that people can do to improve their blues guitar playing. What's the number one thing for you? Well, this might sound odd and totally unexpected because people turn into blues guitar playing for the most part because they're into uh, like heartfelt blues guitar solos and the nitty gritty emotional soloing. But a lot of things that we aspire to at our soloing also comes from having great skills um, to, to back up your own soloing and to back up your playing and improvisational skills aren't only reserved for playing great blues guitar solos, but you can also, and I think you should also use improvisational tactics and strategies on uh, rhythm playing. And not only look at scales from uh, only a lead guitar point. Let me um, play just an example and you will immediately, uh, the people who are here live or watching um, uh, than the recording, I will play just something I will hear immediately what I'm getting into here. <laughs> Thank you. 
So here I'm combining different techniques. It's not per se a lead guitar part. It's not per se a rhythm part, but I'm combining riffs and combining chords and I'm combining my pentatonic scales to form one big improvisation. Because if people ask you to play something like at a party or a family gathering, it's really, uh, it might be confrontational to uh, just play something like you're used to playing like a scale, but it doesn't really sound uh, like a full band experience. And this is one way to get this in your playing and also to improve your rhythm playing and lead playing at the same time and also start improvising with both rhythm and lead parts. So an easy way to get into this is to play the uh, regular blues riffs that are uh, though for the majority of beginner blues guitarists who are starting and into getting into these riffs. And if you uh, haven't started playing those riffs, check, check out the website, uh, bestbluesguitarlessonsonline.com, where I have a lot of articles about shuffle rhythms, these uh, riffs, and how to play more advanced versions, even uh, for the more uh, advanced players also. But if you start out with playing those riffs, a lot of time people get stuck playing those riffs over and over again and it might sound too boring for them and I agree it sounds quite boring if you just I know all this sort of riff but it doesn't mean we need to get away from this we just need to implement improvisational skills to this and if we're playing this riff now in A so I'm on the fifth and fourth string with this little basic uh, beginner riff if we can experiment with adding the chord that we're playing over so the, the tonality uh, of the riff that we're playing in is the A7 so we can add any A7 chord for him. so any A7 chord at that moment um, until we go to the next um, chord and the, the 12 bar chord progression here and if you don't know anything about 12 bar 12 bar chord progressions th this might be even too early but you should start of course with the beginner stuff then but i know 90 percent here know about the 12 bar progression so you can add in the chords at any time in between the riff so it doesn't sound really boring it sounds quite fresh if you do this next measure I didn't go uh, playing this ref I played the chord and then when the next chord came around in this case the D7 chord I played it here but I could also make the decision to play it here and it's a kind of improvisational freedom that not a lot of people tie to rhythm guitar playing they tie it to lead guitar playing and the same holds true when they learn the minor pentatonic scale they tie all of these improvisational skills as uh, uh, being tied to lead guitar playing but you can experiment with uh, rhythm guitar playing as well <laughs> just like really common blues licks and i've added a youtube video just today on the youtube channel about the five um, 
greatest blues licks to start out with. So one of those licks, if you don't know it, is this. <laughs> I think it will free up your playing it will free up your stress hormones if people uh, ask you to play something a uh, family gathering or something so it's a great thing to get into so this is my number one tip for people who want to play better sounding uh, blues parts cool stuff all right anthony so you did not talk about the thing i thought you might uh but your your topic was awesome so in the previous uh, thing, when you were talking about rakes, when we were, I think that was uh, number two, you were talking about rakes. You played some rakes. Now, I can't do it on this guitar because I've got a, I've got a uh, fixed bridge here, but you've got a, a floating bridge. So, and you fisted the bridge, okay, for vibrato. So, do you want to talk about fisting the guitar? Right, so there are a lot of people uh, in the blues who play Stratocasters with a floating bridge and they set up the bridge like Fender actually um, describes it in, in, their, um, in, in their technical uh, um, paper. So if you do it that way, then you can bend up um, any note by just pressing down on the bridge here. A lot of people actually do it in, uh, in, in blues music, other styles as well. Uh, Jeff Beck comes to mind. He does, does a lot of this with his whammy bar. Most of the time, I don't use the whammy bar, but it's the same thing as if you would use one. You just press down the bridge, and uh, most people know how this kind of things work with the strings being uh, pulled at either side if you press down the bridge or you can even, um, you can even go under the bridge but it's kind of uh, easier to do it with a one way bar then if you want to go uh, you know form it that way we form the nodes in, in this manner but yeah it's, it's a really cool thing to do you can use this on uh, notes like if you would uh, add vibrato you could use it as a little bend. You could use it on chords as well. press down here the bridge with your fist but you need to set it up so it's a floating bridge a lot of people end up buying the guitar in the shop and it doesn't come like pre-formatted with the floating bridge so uh, you either need to uh, look up how to uh, fix uh, the bridge set up the bridge so it floats or get to uh, a builder a guitar builder so he can do it for you Good stuff. I love the the floating bridge. I'm on my guitar behind me here. I've got a one that's with, with the floating bridge and I use it all the time for, for chords or whatever. But yeah, you've got to have a, a floating bridge in order to do that. But it's it sounds really, really cool. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we're going to put uh, Anthony's Facebook uh, page for his best blues guitar lessons in the chat. You should be seeing that now or very soon. So Anthony, let's go through and answer some of these questions here we have live uh, with us right now. Uh, let's see. Uh, here, let's take this one. This is the very first one I'm seeing. Can you talk a little about hitting the string right on the fret versus in between two frets? Want to take that one, Anthony? Yeah, sure. So um, a lot of the times when we start out playing the guitar, we think it doesn't really matter where to put the finger, but it does matter a lot. And you shouldn't like uh, lose sleep on it if you're just starting out. But if you're playing for a long time and went to um, like experience better technique, 
um, it uh, pays attention, so it pays to pay attention here. If you play like uh, arpeggios or scales, like you know, in this case, I play A minor arpeggio. So it's really great to go really slightly towards the fret with the finger. So instead of fretting down the string in the middle of the of the fret, uh, in, in the middle of uh, between the two frets, I mean. We just go slightly towards the fret without really touching it, because if we touch the fret uh, dead on, and I'm pressing down now on the fret, it will dampen the sound. This is not what we want. We want to go straight uh, for uh, just um, really alongside uh, the fret, really close by. And there are a lot of times when you can can't really do this, like if you take uh, any chord on the guitar, a lot of the times we need to find alternatives because like with a, just a normal E minor chord, like the index finger here can be moved really close to the fret. So we need to find a way to make it work. But um, I'm talking mostly about playing arpeggios now, playing lead guitar, playing with the chords. And the best advice is if it sounds well, it is good. Because the thing is, you most of the time don't need to be a virtuoso to, to change chords fast. But if you want to speed up your playing, if you want to play fast like arpeggios and solos, you need not only the minimum amount of tension, but you need the best way on the fretboard to, uh, to place your finger and also the minimum amount of tension and these these all come into play so great question yeah good stuff We've got another uh question here uh let's see this one is how how to do first finger micro bends i i think what he means here is sort of putting the stank on it like <laughs> You want to tackle? I think that's what he means by that question. You want to answer that one, Anthony? Yeah. So that's a great question. So thanks, uh, Brian, for asking this. And a lot of the time, we can do amazing things, like we, when we were talking about the slides, without doing much, without adding much techniques and experiment with uh, experiment with something so simple like the slides or no the micro bands can do a lot for your playing then i would suggest to take um, for instance just a normal scale basic uh, scale like uh, the blue scale for example and then to add like micro bands on every note so instead of trying to add it on some of the notes <laughs> Just try to add it everywhere. And this gives a more edgy sound to your playing immediately. And here I'm not making a lot of fuss about the exact technique that I'm using. I'm just pulling or pressing up the string a little bit. So the micro tonality, there's a lot of um, theory behind this. And there's a guy who used a little clip from one of the videos that's on my YouTube channel who explains it really well. But it's on the topic of piano playing. I'm a guitar player, so I'm just pulling or pushing the string a little bit. And it's not a full band, it's not a half band. It's somewhere close to being no band and a half band, but you, there's a lot of um, things that you can experiment with, like in terms of pitch height. But mostly, uh, in most cases, we just want to use it in blues playing as a technique, as a way of expressing ourselves, and we don't want to make a whole fuss about exact pitch height when talking about these little blues bands. So, all right. Very good. Yeah. And that's good. It's just it's something that you would do sometimes, you know. Perhaps not on every note, but you could practice it that way to just get the use of the technique. Let's check out, uh, let's see, another question here, Anthony. I'll let you take this one too. 
Uh, with vibrato, I tend to shake my wrist a little. Is it just the finger or the finger and the wrist? So I think what I think what uh, is being asked here is from where does the motion come when doing vibrato? Right. So there are basically two things you need to know. So um, the first thing is if you don't overcomplicate it, a lot of the times we can do a lot by just thinking in the way that I described earlier by massaging the string and je uh, or just wiggling the string back and forth. So we can pull the string, push the string, or even go both ways and push and pull the string and then experiment with it in this way. And the way we're adding vibrato can in this way be done by using the fingers. We can also use the forearm uh, and I'm coming back to this uh, in just a minute, but uh, it really, really doesn't matter if you sound, uh, if your guitar vibrator doesn't sound well, how you start out with. And experimentation in this manner, it won't form bad habits at first, but you need to be aware of what is generally described as the guitar technique, uh, the best advice for adding vibrator. Um, in terms of getting more control over the string, getting more control in terms of timing over your vibra vibrator. And in general, you want to not use the finger to add vibrator. And of course, this is in general because a lot of great players use the fingers at some times as well. But if they need more control, um, especially if it's a really fast vibrator, they uh, use this forearm motion and we want to experiment with like it's it's like turning um, a doorknob it's like opening a door like this technique uh, and the thumb is wrapped around the neck here and then we're um, rotating um, our arm as if the thumb wa was a or um, how to describe it or rotational point here so i'm basically holding my finger on the note Thump wrapped around the neck, and then I'm just doing this opening of the door technique. So you will develop the best technique when practicing in this way, but this doesn't mean you can't experiment with a gazillion other cool things like just using the finger or using more of gravity. You don't even need to turn, maybe you can see it, but if you just place your finger here, you can just use more gravity and to massage the string. But uh, in general, if you need fast and controlled vibrator, I would spend 90% of my practice time trying to get the vibrator uh, right in terms of technique by using this rotation of the forearm. All right, very good stuff. Uh, let's go through this question, Anthony. What is the perfect left hand finger position parallel to the fretboard? I think what he means is the fingers parallel to the frets or a little angle, little angled. I think he means like this, uh, especially playing strings one, two, and three. What are your thoughts on that, Anthony? Right, great question, William. Thanks for asking also. So here um, I'm going to play through some stuff because it's, it's determined the, the, the best technique of the left hand and the way to hold the left hand is determined by what you are playing. So if you're playing like this kind of stuff... you can see that my thumb is wrapped around the neck because this also gives us additional freedom to do the vibrato whenever we want and really quickly if we're holding the thumb behind the neck then i need to wrap my thumb really quickly around the neck whenever i need vibrato and also the bending technique is best controlled 
and the way as described with the forearm motion. That's why we wrap around the term, around the neck when playing pentatonic licks, bluesy licks with a lot of vibrato and bending. But if you're then going playing a bit more avant-garde blues guitar like the Robin Ford style, and we're using, for example, a Dorian scale. <laughs> here in this example this is a great mode to incorporate into your blues play then i would experiment more with adding the pinky finger here also and i'm adding here the, uh, i'm placing the tongue more uh, a bit more towards underneath the neck so my fingers are still a bit angled here I would only use the strict classical technique. A lot of classical guitarists uh, use this technique because that's what they are told to do so. Um, I would only use this if I don't need to add vibrato or if I don't need to add uh, the, the bendings or rock vibrato. So um, in this way, it's, uh, I think, uh, good to play a fast part. You can play that. If you need to play fast, it's great. But in blues playing, a lot of the time, we don't even need it. And we are playing more than God of playing without, the right hand, without a lot of right hand. And then we can... Um, of course, look at this technique also, even though if we go up and down the neck of the guitar, like you see in Joe Satriani is playing, he uh, angles the fingers a bit. So it's more kind of a personal preference together with like, what, what are you playing at this moment? So if you're going up and down the neck, I'm angling more my fingers in this way because then I'm able to control my motions of shifting my hand towards uh, up, going up and down on the neck more um, because I have my tongue here and, I, and then I can add vibrato whenever I want also but some people do it with uh, the, the classical uh, position. But adding the thumb, placing it behind the neck. So I would say experiment with the two ways of placing your thumb behind the neck and then around the neck. And if you place it around, of course, your fingers will be more angled. And I think this is what you were aiming at with your question. I hope I didn't misinterpret uh, your question. So, but thanks for asking. All right, very good. We have time for maybe one more. Let's take this one, Anthony. How can I learn to play the changes of the chords while improvising a solo? Now, I could interpret this question in more than one way. I think what is meant here, my interpretation of the question is, when improvising the solo, how do you play to those changes? So when the one chord is being played, how, how are you playing differently over the one chord than you would over the four chord or whatever? That's how I interpret it. You, do you interpret it that way or is it? Right. Yes. I got the right. same feeling about. Okay. Uh, Want to take that one then? Right. Cool. So it's a really cool thing to be able to play over the changes like uh, as mentioned here in the comments. It's a great question and a great way to get into if you're getting more and more into advanced territory in your guitar playing. The thing with playing over the changes is that there's a lot that you can do and it's, it depends on how deep and the uh, rabbit hole you want to go. And because we don't have a lot of time, I will tell you the easiest way to do this. And the easiest way to play more over the chords, and if you don't know what this means, it simply means that you're using the notes that are in the chords to uh, outline your licks more. So if you're playing, for example, in a 12-bar progression, typical 12-bar, you would play more 
uh, less like minor pentatonic stuff all the way through every on every chord, but you would sort of more like that. If you play over the A7 chord, then if you would play over the D7, chord, you would play something more like that. So you play different scales you make different choices on each chord and this is a great thing to get into as I explained before if you get into more advanced territory but the easiest way to get into this is to just look at where your fingers are on the fretboards when you place your fingers on the chord so no I'm holding back uh, holding uh, my fingers on a D9 chord and somebody asked me today in an email how to Pick your fingers, how to hold your fingers on the D9 or D9 chord. So I'm just barring down here the three highest strings. And then I'm placing my index and my middle finger on the fifth and fourth string. But we can play the chord as well with the index, uh, with the ring finger, the third finger here on the G string, and then the pinky finger on the B string. So in this case, we're neglecting the high E string. And this is a great chord to swap the D7 chord and blues play and to make it more, to make our blues rhythm play more jazzy. And if you're playing over the D7 chord or over the D9 chord, uh, it doesn't matter which, which kind of voicing you take with the ring finger here uh, and a bar chord, or you just take the, fin uh, the pinky finger here on the B string. We just look at the fingers where they are on the fretboard and then we land on one or multiple of these notes if we play it. And as described earlier in the live stream, we can just play in a very simple scale like a descending minor pentatonic scale to start out with. But now I'm sliding into the notes that are here under my fingers on the D9 chord. And a lot of people talk about chord tone targeting, which is basically what we're doing right here. That's very complicated. You need to study your theory. You need to study uh, a lot of different scales and choices. And all of this is true. You need to do your homework. You need to learn how everything's connected on the guitar. But this is a really simple way of getting into this uh, a bit more advanced uh, guitar uh, technique here. You just take the chord, look at where your fingers are when you place them on the chord, and then you slide into one of the notes. And this is really easy because learning the theory behind this takes a bit more time, but looking at where your fingers are, you can do this trick even with the most complex chords. If you don't know, uh, if you're playing over, for instance, the G major 7 chord and you don't know what the theory behind this chord is, you can just look at your fingers and play anything and then slide into one of the notes here that are inside of the chord when, of course, the chord is, is changed to, to this chord. You just slide to one of the notes or to multiple notes and then you hold on to these notes. So this is a one of the easiest ways to get into this uh but great question great stuff awesome thanks for those questions everybody thanks for the answers uh you provided as well anstey so anstey you have something uh for free that they can download i believe is that correct right right so i have a free guide free ebook actually on my website uh, the link is uh, displayed here it's best blues guitar lessons online.com forward slash blues rhythm guitar and if you just go to the home page of the website you will see it there also you can download it download it for free and it goes about the chords and the riffs that we were talking about previously, if you want to experience how it feels. It is to do this kind of stuff and to swap the chords with the riffs and experiment with improvisation and the rhythm aspect and to do it basically like the masters of blues guitar, 
This is a great ebook and it's totally free. You can get it on the website. You will see all the tablatures and even audio examples of everything you need to do to get acquainted with uh, this great way of playing. All right, very good. Thank you, Anthony. I also have something for you guys that you can download for free. You can do it right now. It's the secret to adding fire and emotion to any guitar lick. Okay, even if you don't play guitar fast, you're not advanced yet, that's fine. Uh, you know, there are ways that you can take the, ex the skills that you already have, the existing skills, and make them sound better without learning anything new or becoming learning new skills. I don't mean to imply that we should not learn new skills. I only mean to say that this is designed to help you take the skills that you already have and get more from them, play with more fire and emotion. That's what this is all about. You can check it out on my website. It's totally free. No strings attached. Thomas.net forward slash emotions. And there you go. Download it right now. It's just totally free. All right. Thank you, uh, everyone, for the questions that you asked. Uh, thank you, Anthony, for all of the uh, things that you shared with everybody today. Uh, it's been great seeing you guys. Anthony, thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. It was really great. I enjoyed it. Thanks. My pleasure. We'll do it again real soon. Take care. Check out Anthony's Facebook page. Check out his YouTube channel. See you guys next time. Have a great rest of your day.